Currently, she is the CEO and founder of two startups, Busy Bee and Femgineer, and is spending the fall of 2013 lecturing at Duke University. When she's not running companies and building products, she's practicing Bikram yoga, cooking, or traveling around the world. So without further ado, Panima Vijay inviting me out here. I guess I went to the other, other school, Duke, um, but that doesn't mean that I can't come and teach and lecture out here. I actually have had one student in Femgineer um, who graduated from NC State. He did electrical engineering uh, and master's program, so I'm going to hopefully have some, some ties to you all. And I really just wanted to, tonight, um, you know, you've spent the whole day hearing lectures and watched PowerPoint slides, so really what I wanted to do is share a little bit of my journey in technology and in entrepreneurship with the hopes of giving you a sense of what it not just really takes, but how you can sort of meander through it um, and still manage to make change in the world and have a career that you can be proud of. Uh, so, you know, I was never that kid that had a lemonade stand. In fact, I think when I was six, I sold some popcorn or tried to sell some popcorn balls, failed miserably, and decided, you know, just wasn't in the cards for me to be selling stuff and that I wanted to be a little bit more of an intellectual. So I was always drawn to things like math and science and writing stories, and that's <coughs> where I focused most of my childhood. So uh, he would ask me, you know, when I was a kid, if I wanted to be an entrepreneur, I would have said, what the hell is an entrepreneur? And <laughs> that's not what I want to do. I want to be a professor, I want to be a writer, I want to be a lawyer. Um, which also goes to tell you that I didn't know that I wanted to be an engineer. Uh, in fact, um, even though I was introduced to engineering really early on, I was three years old, my dad would take me to his engineering classes at San Jose State. He was studying electrical engineering, he was getting his master's degree, and I would just be on the floor, you know, rifling through books and looking through all the squiggles and crazy symbols, not knowing what they meant. Um, and I just, you know, didn't think anything of it. And surprisingly enough, um, you know, he would he graduated and he would he would talk about building these things called chips and wafers. And I thought, wow, what a what a cool job. He's making food all day long. Uh, how come he never brings any of this home, right? And as a as a young kid, I was just like, hey, where are these chips and wafers? And so one day, for, fortunately, he came home and said, hey, do you want to come and visit my job? And I thought, wow, this is like my golden opportunity to try these chips and wafers he's always talking about. And so he took me to his fab at Texas Instruments. Uh, I grew up mostly in Texas. And uh, you know, he, before we entered the, the room, he said, don't touch anything because you're going to contaminate the, the chips. And I you know, was, OK, I, I won't. Um, and then I entered the room, and I was surprised because as a 10-year-old, I looked around, and all I saw was white everywhere. And, people in spacesuits, and I was like, where are these chips and wafers? Like, nothing makes sense here. And then he took me to this spot in the middle of the room where there was a, a glass box, and I looked inside the box, and there was this tiny robot arm that was just very precisely picking up small black squares and, and moving them to the other side. And then I immediately got fascinated. I totally forgot about the fact that I was there to try to the wafers, because I was just like, wow, look at how precise this thing is. And that's really where I got drawn into technology. And after that, you know, I went on to take computers apart and learn how to program and did all of this before I got to college. But I never thought about having a career in technology. Because to me, you know, I saw my dad sitting in a cubicle all day, and I thought, well, sure, there are these cool robots, but like, you just sit around all day. That doesn't seem exciting. I want to do something, you know, more fulfilling than that. And so I just thought of technology as a hobby, and didn't really think anything of it. And when I got to college, um, I decided to major in economics. And if you've ever, if any of you have majored in economics, um, you know kind of what freshman year is like. And for me, I was bored out of my mind. Uh, just because all I was doing was writing papers and it just didn't feel right. And so then I decided to go and take a computer science course. And after my first project, I was just excited because I got to build something. 
and I got to show some, some results, and I knew immediately that that's what I wanted to do, that I wanted to be an engineer. And then a, a year later, I also uh, double majored in electrical engineering. And then, you know, after this point, I decided, well, since I'm an engineer, I gotta be where all the other, or the majority of engineers hang out, I've gotta be in Silicon Valley. And so I decided that I wanted to, you know, leave uh, this area and move out. And my first job was as an R&D engineer. Uh, I was building software, uh, CAD tools, for big chip manufacturers. And after the first year, I had that same feeling that I had my freshman year where I felt like, I'm not really being challenged. I feel like I need to do something else. And being in, in Silicon Valley at the time, there was a lot of buzz around startups. But I didn't really know how to begin. I never studied, you know, I dropped out of econ, so I didn't even know much about finance. Uh, I certainly didn't know much about business. And I felt like, well, you know, I, I think I could build something, but I don't think I can start my own business. And fortunately for me, uh, my good buddy, Aaron Hotzer, who graduated a couple years before me from Duke, told me that he was going to be moving to the area and that he had an idea for a product. And so we got to talking, and his idea was that he wanted to build a personal finance website. And he wanted to build this because he wanted to make it painless for people to manage their finances, especially for young folks who want to be out and about and you know, spend money but still save. And, and so I thought this was a great idea and that I wanted to participate. And so my uh, first contribution occurred when we were on a ski trip to Tahoe. And you know, I told Aaron, or asked Aaron, like, so what's the name of this company that you're going to be starting? And he said, Money Intelligence. And I thought, God, that's an awful name. <laughs> I don't know who's going to want to buy. I don't, I don't know if any 20 something's going to want to buy a product called Money Intelligence. And so he was, of course, said, Well, you think of something better. And so I thought for a couple minutes, and, and then I said, Well, what about Mint? You know, makes sense, right? And then he thought, Oh, that's great. God, it's going to be hard to get that domain. Um, fortunately, we did, but it did take some effort. And so after that first contribution, I just immediately got interested in working at Mint. And unfortunately at the time, I had some student loans and had to pay rent and all these things, so I couldn't just um, jump on board. So for a good nine months, Aaron worked on the prototype, and then when he got his first round of funding, um, I quickly joined as one of the founding engineers. And the interesting um, thing, when I, when I joined Mint, my whole desire at the time was that I wanted to learn what it was like to build a product end to end. I didn't just want to continue to build features. Um, I didn't think that I wanted to go beyond that. And really, for me, I just wanted to learn how to build a product. Uh, and so that was my goal, being at Mint. But surprisingly enough, I learned two other things being at Mint. The first thing that I learned was how to form a company. So I, because I had never had a business degree, because I hadn't gone out and started something off on my own, I didn't know what it took. And so being there very, very early on, you know, as a first employee, I got to see how we evolved the company. I got to see how Eric fundraised, and I got to see how um, we recruited people, and how we slowly built the product, and marketed it, and, and went out and talked to customers. So that was really, really valuable. And you know, I probably could have gotten the same thing out of an MBA program, but the experience was just richer having done it firsthand and have gone through some war stories. The second thing that I learned, which I, you know, once again don't think I even would have gotten out of going to a, a business school, was that I got a chance to interact with customers and I really got to understand how to develop a product. Uh, and by that I mean, one of the very early on things that we did was we went out and we talked to people before we built anything, and we got a real sense of what people's needs were. So we understood that there was one segment, mostly 20-somethings, who were really interested and open to a product like ours, and then there was another segment that either didn't really want anything or was happy with our competitors' products. And then even in both of these groups, they brought up things like security as an issue and, hey, can we trust you young startup 20-somethings with our, with our money? And in hearing all of that feedback, we incorporated it into the product. 
Now that's not something I had been taught at engineering school, right? In engineering school, I had been taught, here's a spec, uh, here's a project, go out and build it. And got really good at building it, but didn't really understand how to take people's feedback and then translate it into a product that could be rich. So that was, that was the second big learning that I had at Mint. And over the course of time, you know, as I was learning how to talk to customers and as I was learning how to build this company, you know, the thought occurred to me of, what am I going to do after this? And we almost joked about it on the team, like, oh, there's no after this. This is all we're going to do for the rest of our lives. Um, but surprisingly enough, you know, Mint did get acquired. And right after the acquisition, I had to make a decision. I this had to decide whether or not I wanted to continue to work there, um, or if I wanted to go take a position somewhere else, or possibly strike out on my own. And so for me, I had that founding engineer experience, and I knew how to build a product, so I felt pretty confident about that. But I didn't know if I could build a company next. And so that was the next challenge for me in terms of making the transition from being an engineer into an entrepreneur and within the technology space. And so I decided, you know, despite all the great offers and despite the love of Mint and wanting to stick around, that I would sort of take the um, path of striking out on my own and, and becoming a founder. And so in January of 2010, I left Mint to start Busy. Now, the main thing, you know, once again, because learning is important in entrepreneurship, the main thing I wanted to sort of challenge myself and to learn was, you know, could I actually build a company? Could I build a product on my own? I certainly proved that I could with Mint, but could I do it again? And then, what's it like to actually be an entrepreneur? You know, I never thought about it. I failed as a kid, so I thought, well, I've got some lessons here. Maybe I can apply some of them. And so, that's really where I started. And I wanted to do something that I was really interested in. And so, you know, as mentioned in the intro, I'd been practicing Bikram yoga for six years at that point. And now it's close to nine or ten. Um, and I'd seen this market just really grow in the years that I've been doing it. And I saw that all these businesses were operating the same, but they all weren't using technology to you know, advance their business. And I thought, well, here's a market opportunity and also a space that I have particular domain expertise in. That's what I want to focus on. And so I built BusyBee to um, initially start with the yoga market, but since then we've expanded into a number of fitness businesses uh, and we basically offer a CRM solution. So, you know, it was great to think about the product and I used a lot of my learnings from Mint, but there were some challenges. So if any of you have read this book called E-Myth, uh, the author talks about what it's like to be an entrepreneur. And specifically says that there's sort of three things you have to think about if you decide that you're going to go down this path. So the first thing is that you start off as a technical person. And by technical, I don't mean engineering. I mean, you've got some specific skill set, and you can develop a product. <coughs> the second is you also have to play the role of a manager. So not only are you building, but you're also managing other people, teaching them how to take over the product or to operate the business. And then the third is you've got to be the visionary. You're the one that's building the company or the business after all, and you have to know how to lead people. Now this is not something that you know a lot of first-time entrepreneurs are aware of, and it kind of hits you in the face. Uh, and the way it hits you in the face is when you realize you've got to build a team, you've got to go out and raise capital, and you've still got to build a product. And so one of the learnings that I got out of starting BusyBee was how do you balance these three roles? And it also caused me to question whether or not I wanted to do those three things. And so I bring it up because a lot of times people don't think about that. They oftentimes think about entrepreneurship as just this uh, driver towards change. But that change has to come first from you deciding, you know, are you that person that's capable of it? The second thing that I, aside from exploring these three roles, that I learned uh, from being at BusyBee is that it's very, very different to be a founding engineer from a founder. 
Uh, and the reason is because when you're a founding engineer, you actually have a little bit of a cushy job. You get to sit there and build product all day. Sure, you like talk to marketing and product and um, biz dev, and you get to see all these roles, but your primary responsibility is to build product. Whereas as a founder, your primary responsibility is all the responsibilities of a company. And that means that you've got to keep your customers happy, you've got to keep your employees happy, you've got to potentially go out and you know, talk to investors if that's what you're interested in. Or if you're bootstrapping, then figure out you know, how are you going to make payroll. And so all of a sudden, you know, I quickly started to learn that being a founder is very, very different and it requires you know, multiple skill sets. It's not just about having one particular technical skill. And the challenge then became, you know, is this something I'm interested in? Now, fortunately for me, um, and you know, maybe this is indicative for all of you as well, um, is that growing up, because I had all these different interests, science and math and writing and speaking, I was able to coalesce all of them together and be able to build this company. Um, but if I hadn't had all of those talents, I think it would have been even a harder challenge. So, you know, we've been building Visumi for some time. Um, I did raise some capital, and now it's become uh, focused more mostly on being a bootstrap business. Um, but over the course of building both Visumi and Mint, I started this side project. And uh, the side project was, was called Fengineer. And the reason that I started Fengineer was that I wanted to uh, get back into writing. And being in engineering school and being at Mint, I didn't really have a whole lot of time to sit there and write whatever I wanted. And so I decided, some of my friends said, hey, why don't you take up blogging? And I thought, okay, sure, uh, I'll do this. Um, and what was interesting is the first year or two that I was blogging, I didn't really think anything of it. You know, I didn't optimize like SEO or I didn't you know, think about putting AdWords or anything like that. I just kind of wrote to get some thoughts out. And uh, most importantly, I wrote about engineering and entrepreneurship because that's what I was doing day in and day out at Mint. Uh, and then as I started to get out and talk to people, you know, they would just say, oh yeah, I, I know your blog. I know if I'm engineer. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. People are reading this. Uh, and the reason I bring up the story is because Femgineer actually just began as a project for myself. You know, and a lot of times entrepreneurs will talk about this where they just started something because they just wanted to do it. And they, I had no long-term vision for Femgineer. Um, in fact, I was writing pretty sporadically. It was maybe an article or a post a week or maybe once a month, but I couldn't think of it as anything else. Uh, and then an interesting thing started to happen. You know, not only did my readership go up, but people started reaching out to me explicitly because of Femgineer. People reached out to have me speak and to teach. And towards the end of last year, I started to have so many demands that I thought, well, you know, maybe I should make this into a business. And, and it hadn't dawned on me before. And I, at the time of thinking of this becoming a business, I wanted it to be a bit different. You know, I didn't want to make money off of the advertising, not because that's bad, um, but just because I wanted to do something greater. And so what I realized is people were coming because they wanted my expertise. They wanted to learn about how to build a product, how to start a company, um, how to do engine, software engineering, and so really they were coming because they wanted to get educated. And that's when I decided that I wanted it to be an education service. And so uh, I began that, but I had one very tricky problem, um, which was that I had basically no capital to start this business. I put most of my savings into starting busy me, and I also knew it was the type of business that when you get started, you can't really go out and look for investment. So I decided that I would just run a small experiment, uh, and the reason I bring this up is because you know a lot of times when you're doing this entrepreneur is you're running small experiments, and then you're figuring out what you learned and what you didn't. So the small experiment that I ran was I put up a one-page ad on my site and said, hey, whoever wants to take an eight-week online course on product development with me can sign up here. And I, of course, got some feedback and tweaked it and did all of that, but I managed to recruit 10 students. And then I decided, okay, well, it's going to fund itself now. And so that's how I started the first iteration back in January. And then since then, we've had three iterations, and every time, this has been my approach to recruit students to pay for their class, and then I go out and, and teach it. 
Uh, and what's been most fascinating, though, is that in building Femgeneer, um, I realized that I can't ask the same questions that I would as a, a technology product, right? Where I go out and say, okay, we're going to like A-B test this, or we're going to go out and talk to these customers and get feedback. Um, with an education service, I have to do a little <coughs> bit more uh, in terms of customer development. Like, I actually have to ask students, how do you want to learn? Or what's the most effective way that you learn? Or what's interesting to you? And, and that led me to realize that part of this uh, new startup, uh, or part of this new experience, was to ask the right questions. So all throughout my career, I had always approached um, entrepreneurship as I'm going to have this goal, and then we're going to meet this goal. But then I started to realize that it was less about the goals or the milestones, and it was more about what was the change that we wanted to make. So with Mint, the change that we wanted to make was we wanted to have people who were more interested in their personal finances, but had an easy way to solve them. And so we asked ourselves some questions in that process. With BusyBee, I wanted to build a really simple solution for people who didn't really want technology, but you know, needed it to run their business. And with Benjamin you know, I wanted to understand if people were actually interested in education, uh, and particularly engineering education and, and technology education. And so, you know, it was asking the right set of questions. Now, the other part of this uh, that's a little bit of a challenge is, um, you know, too often we kind of want to force things a certain way, right? We want to go out and raise capital, or we want to figure out how we can grow the business as quickly as possible. And so I decided with Fremgineer that I would take a little bit of a different approach and focus more on providing the best quality education that I could rather than trying to build up as big a business as I could to, to begin with. Um, not because building a big business is bad, uh, but just because I really wanted to understand how people uh, think and how they learn. So uh, all of this is to say that you know when you think about entrepreneurship, right? A lot of times people think about it as we're a driver for change, and that's certainly true. And you can enact that change by creating a product and having a vision behind it. But a lot of times that change has to come from what is it that you're particularly interested in, right? So for me, I just happen to have a 30, uh, almost 30 year old uh, tech background, and if you've got one too, then it makes sense. Right? But if you've got a background in some, something else, some other passion or interest, then I would encourage you to explore that as well. Um, the second thing which I talked about is not just it being about change, but also thinking about your role as an entrepreneur. Right? So looking back to what I talked about with the e-myth, right? you have to think about, is that the right role for you? Do you want to initially be that technician that then moves into a managerial role that then becomes the visionary? Can you balance all of those? And sometimes we find that maybe we don't have all those skills yet, and we have to go out and get some more uh, training, whether that's public speaking, or that's coaching, or whether it's getting some mentorship to understand how to build an organization and how to motivate people. So this is also something to think about when you think about entrepreneurship. And then the third is asking the right, not just the right, but asking questions. Right? Too often we think in terms of just purely milestones, like. We've got to hit this revenue target, or we've got to hit um, you know, this funding target, or you know, we have to have this many people sign up. But instead, if we kind of reverse that and say, well, you know, what is it going to take for people to sign up? Or what is it going to take for people to fund this kind of project? When we start to ask questions like that, you know, it actually makes the process, uh, one, more of a, a learning exercise, um, and two, you get rid of a lot of your apprehensions and anxieties that you typically have as an entrepreneur. And then the final thing I'll say on, on being an entrepreneur or pursuing this, whether it's in the case of technology or something else, is you know we don't do it for sort of the, the glory. Um, a lot of it is that it is a learning process, right? And so a lot of times um, I get students like yourselves who come up to me and ask me this question of, well, I'm graduating this year, and I don't know if I should start a company, go be a consultant, or go work for a big company. What do you think? Right? And I tell them, you know, it, it's really a, a personal choice. Um, for myself, 
So getting in a big company was something I had to do because I had student loans. But if you still have that passion where you have a desire to change or you have a product idea or there's something that you desperately want to work on, then don't necessarily put that on the back burner, right? Think about how you can work on it even incrementally, right? Too often we think we have to go at something with full force. But for me, at least with Femgeneer, unlike Mint and BusyBee, I did it on an incremental basis. So know that um, no one's going to take your idea and, and run away with it, uh, or that you won't have a chance to work on it, but figure out a way in which you can even make small steps towards it, whether it's interviewing a customer a week or a month, or thinking about how you can um, just get the word out about it, right? So, so think, about those, think about it in those terms. And then the last thing um, that I'll, I'll say is uh, you're going to hit some roadblocks, right? And this is also part of the challenge, is how resourceful can you be? And I, one of the reasons I really um, value the fact that I have this engineering degree, and you know, it doesn't mean that everybody has to rush out and get an engineering degree, um, but one of the reasons that I like it is that it teaches you how to be resourceful, it teaches you how to think sort of in multiple dimensions. So think about that, because you're not always going to have the resources that you want to make the change, and it's going to take some time whether that's time, whether that's talent, or whether that's money. And so it's up to you to decide how are you going to continue to maybe hit those milestones, and how are you going to continue to make the change or build the product. Um, so a lot of it is, is trying to be as scrappy as you can for as long as you can. All right, and um, I'll just make one final plug before we go to Q&A, Q um, which is that if any of you are ever interested in watching some of my Duke lectures, they are available for free. On YouTube, our channel is Fengineers. Um, and if you're interested in taking uh, my online courses, then feel free to come up and chat with me or check us out on Fengineers.